fight, we'd all die might. Christ is the strength and Christ thy right. Lay hold on life and it shall be thy joy and crown eternally. Faith no fear is arms are near. It changeth not and thou art there. Only believe and thou shalt see. The Christ is all in all to thee. Amen. Good evening. It's a great time to be in fellowship once again. We welcome you to the King's Chamber Lakey um, midweek service that we have tagged equipping the saints and communion service. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we are excited once again because it is a privilege to come into your world. It's another opportunity to learn at your feet. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life that we have enjoyed. We thank you because you have kept us throughout the day and we have, you have given us the opportunity to come and hear of you once again. We, we thank you, O oh God, because we are not six feet down below. We thank you because we are not in the mortuary, we are in the sanctuary. The Bible says where two or three are gathered in your name, you are here. We recognize the fact that virtually we are gathered, we are more than two, we are more than three. And so we ask Holy Spirit that you gather with us by the power of your spirit. We ask that you speak to us. We ask that you would cause us to hear your word. Let your word come forth with power, with accuracy. Let it be the undiluted word. Let our lives be transformed in the name of Jesus. Everyone that will listen to this word, Lord, let us run with it, O God. Let the spirit of God speak to us and to bring something tangible that will profit in the name of Jesus. We ask that the atmosphere be conducive for the entrance and the receipt of your word in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask that you anoint my tongue. I will not do injustice to your word. I will not speak of myself, but I will speak as your spirit gives utterance in the name of Jesus. At the end, O God, let your name be glorified. We pray for our situation and circumstance. Lord, intervene, O God. Take control, O God. Let the, the pandemic come to an end, O God. Let there be recovery. Let there be healing, O God. Let there be restoration in the name of Jesus. For as many as are facing one challenge or the other, finding it difficult to make ends meet, finding it difficult to put food on the table, Holy Spirit, we ask, O God, by the power in your name, intervene, O God, in the name of Jesus. Help us to be a blessing to our generation. Thank you, Father. We return the glory and praise unto you. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Praise the Lord. You're welcome. Um, we thank God for how God has been helping us the, this past few uh, weeks that we've been on lockdown. Thank God because the word of God is not locked down. Thank God because we still have liberty in the spirit to gather, taking advantage of technology. And so we are grateful to God for how he's helped us and for the messages that we've uh, we been receiving. Praise the Lord. Today, um, even though I've tagged the message or the Bible study is actually a Bible study. Uh, there's actually an outline. And we can make the outline available to those of us who are listening in who are not members of the King's Chamber. At the end of this, the, the message, I'll share with you how you can get this outline. So, um, uh, it's a continuation of some of, the, some of the things God has been dealing with us this past Wednesdays and Sundays. And um, speaking to the situation, speaking to the um, current um, situation and circumstance we are in, in in Nigeria and indeed in all over the world, um, trying to see how we can as Christians position ourselves to ensure that we are not caught up in the uncertainties that are happening around us, to know how we can position as believers, what God expects of us, what we need to do, such that as we do those things, we can be rest assured that we will not be among the statistics that are lost, are hopeless or confused. And God will help us even to make the best of the situation in Jesus' name. So it's a continuation of the, of the message I preached last Sunday. Um, and I've titled this, Keeping the Faith. That's why we took that song, Fight the Good Fight of Faith. Keeping the Faith. Um, our text is Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 20, 23. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. That's our text. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. And I'll read. 
let us hold fast the profession of our hope without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. For he is faithful that promised. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. That's another text we should read. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and as professed a good profession before many witnesses. Praise the Lord. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also thou art also called, and art professed a good profession before many witnesses. Praise the Lord. You see similarity between those two places we read, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23, saying that lay hold on a good profession fight the good fight of faith don't give up on your profession of the confession of your faith praise the lord in the last two wednesdays we had had to look at series that we have tagged positioning for the end times and the work of faith so we've looked at the series of positioning for the end times and the work of faith uh, I believe that the Holy Spirit is leading us to continue along these lines. And I'm sure that as we continue to, you know, expose and expound on this, God will begin to decode certain things unto us. The current happenings occasioned by the advent of COVID-19, that is coronavirus, and its aftermath have thrown up several concerns. There are projections of global economic meltdown. There are projections of not just recession, but depression. There are projections that there will be job losses because employers of labor are not earning income to sustain the wage bill. So there are talks about redundancy of, of you know, resizing, downsizing, whatever sizing they want to call it. There are projections that there will be reduced purchasing power. Obviously because if people don't earn income, they can't spend. And if they cannot spend, it's a, it's, it's a vicious cycle. It's, it's, you know, it's like a pack of domino. So if People are laid off and they don't earn income. They obviously cannot purchase. And if they cannot purchase, the people who have produced goods don't have people who can buy them. And the, the you know, domino effect continues like that. There is the oil glut. And I'm sure some of us are aware of the fact that today, Nigeria, we are begging to sell our crude oil at between $12 to $15 per barrel. By the way, cost of production is way higher than that. So we are actually willing and begging to sell our crude at a price lower than the cost of production. That is very scary, and nobody is buying. I read just yesterday that Canada is selling at sub-zero, meaning that they actually are dashing their oil and giving people money for coming to take the oil. Let me, let me say that again so I can sink in. I have produced a good. I produce an item. I can't find buyers for it, but I need to get rid of it. So I tell people, please, if you can come and take this good from me, I'll give you money for coming to take it from me. That is very, very scary. And that's the state we're in. So they are dwindling foreign reserve. Obviously, if you can't sell our crude, money doesn't come into our foreign reserve. And we keep depleting our foreign reserve. There are high inf inflation rates. There will be social unrest. Already, we have social unrest. We have in some areas, some parts of Lagos, that we're told the skirmishes, uh, people saying that you know um, they're coming to attack people, and because they are desperate, they don't have stuff to eat. And generally speaking, the prognosis is that there are difficult times ahead. Now, the tendency is for all of this news to bring fear and apprehension to the heart of the believer. Like I said last Sunday, it is it, quote and unquote general or expected or a natural feeling is that of despair and that of apprehension and that of worry or that of concern that all of this that is happening how does this pan out how does this play out and what does it mean for the believer the aim of this study today and next Wednesday when I'll continue is to provide us with very clear nuggets very clear biblical principles 
by which we can build and sustain a strong faith in the midst of the crisis. Praise the Lord. What God is laying in our hearts and to share with us are not just members of the King's Chamber to the body of Christ generally. As long as you're a believer, you are born again. This word is for you to demonstrate that do not despair. Do not throw your hands up in the air. Do not give up. Do not panic because God has made sufficient provision in his word to, to assure you that as long as you are rooted and grounded in him, this is not the time to panic. This is not time, this is not time to fret. This is not time to give up. This is, not, this is not the time to behave like the unbeliever, like those that have no hope. This is not the time to behave like them. Praise the Lord. I found out that the current happenings in our environment today and in the world is not new. We've had a similar experience, indeed, in the Bible recorded in the Bible times. If you remember the story of the famine, the seven-year famine in Egypt, where Joseph came to the rescue. Let's read some scriptures just to lay, lay, lay this uh, in context. We can draw a parallel from the Bible about the happenings of today. The predicted global meltdown, what we say, the, 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 what the economics and everybody has said would, is happening or is about to happen, can be likened to the days of Joseph. And if you open with me to Genesis chapter 41, Genesis chapter 41, I'll read verse 53 to 57. Genesis chapter 41, verse 53 to 57. Genesis 41, 53 to 57. And the seven years of plenty that was in the land of Egypt were ended. So those seven years, if you, if you have time, please, you can read starting from chapter 41, actually, but because of time. And the seven years of plentiness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. Verse 54. And the seven years of death began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the death was in all lands, but in, the, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what is said unto you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. So just as we have the, the COVID-19 pandemic covering virtually over 180 countries and counting, so also did we have this famine all over the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians, and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn. Because that the famine was so sore in all the land. Jump with me to Genesis 47, verse 13 to 25. That's a long read. Just to establish that this famine was what we are currently experiencing. We had seen it in the time of Joseph in Egypt. Genesis chapter 47, verse 13 to 25. Genesis chapter 47, verse 13 to 25. Genesis 47, 13, 25. And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine, and there was no bread in the land. Just as people are now crying that say they've been locked home for two, three weeks, there's hunger in the land. They experienced it in the time of Joseph in Egypt. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they had bought. And Joseph brought the money unto Pharaoh's house. And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to, unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in the presence? For why should we die in thy presence? For the money failed. That's what um, the economists have project, uh, projected that money will fail. They have projected that it will come a time. That, I mean, you can imagine that we, we, are, we want to sell our crude at below cost price. We can't find people to buy. That's a very serious matter. So this, it has happened in the time of in Egypt. And Joseph said, give your cattle and I will give unto you for your cattle if money fail. Verse 17. And they brought their cattle unto Joseph and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for the flocks and for the castles of the earth, and for the asses, and he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. 
And when that year was ended, they came unto him the second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent. My Lord also at our, our herd of cattle. There is not aught left in the, in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies and our lands. Wherefore shall we die before thy eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die that the land be not desolate. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold every man his field, because the famine prevailed over them, for the land became Pharaoh's pharaohs. And as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even to the other end thereof. Only the land of the priests bought he not, for the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh, and did eat their portion which Pharaoh gave them, wherefore they sold not their land. Verse 23. Then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you and shall sow the land. Praise the Lord. This is very, 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 very scary. These guys, first of all, were using their money to buy bread. After a while, money failed. Money didn't, couldn't do it anymore. Then they gave up their cattle. Then they had no more cattle. Then they gave up their land. And they had no more land. They had to give themselves up so that they could survive. I dare say that what we are about to experience may be something similar to this because there were, 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 it's been predicted that there will be a challenge that would cause the economy to crumble. And so we have seen it, like I've said before. Let me bring out four points, which, uh, which I just want to quickly summarize of those things. I've said. Number one, the famine was so severe that money failed. In modern economics, if, if it were to be today, we say that the, economic, uh, the economy has witnessed what we call unprecedented hyperinflation, such that the piece of paper that money was printed on was not worth the money. So if this piece of paper is, the, the, if it's, let, let's assume that it's 100 naira, that the piece of paper is not even worth 100 naira. That's when the money has failed. Hmm. The people were faced with severe hunger leading to starvation. They were faced with either giving up their land or starving to death. At some point, they gave up their cattle, then they gave up their land, and finally they gave up themselves, and they became servants to Pharaoh. May we not get to the point where starvation is staring us in the face, and we say, you know what, we'd rather sell ourselves as slaves or as, as servants, just we give us bread or give us food to survive. May that not be our portion in Jesus' name. So that's to tell us that, you know, in the, in, 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 in the time of the Bible, we've had that experience before. In all of this, very, very instructive, Joseph, his family, and those around him did not partake of the wars in the land. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whilst the Egyptians were giving up their money, giving up their cattle, giving up their land, and giving up themselves just so that they could eat, the Bible records that Joseph did not partake of that famine. Joseph his family, and by the way, because of time, we didn't go into all those details. Joseph had asked for his family to come from Canaan to come and join him in Egypt, and they were exempted from that famine. Indeed, it is recorded in Genesis chapter 47 and verse 6, we'll read it shortly, that Joseph's family was settled in the choicest part of Egypt called Goshen. Genesis chapter 47 and verse 6. Genesis chapter 47 and verse 6. Genesis 47 and verse 6. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, The land of Egypt is before you. In the best of the land, hallelujah, in the best of the land, make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen, let them dwell. And if thou knowest any man of activity amongst them, then make them rulers over my cattle. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, The land of Egypt is before you. In the best of the land, make thy father and brethren to dwell. Hallelujah. So in Egypt, whilst the Egyptians, the aborigines, the owners of the land, were selling, where money filled them, cattle filled them, land filled them, and they were selling themselves in the same land of Egypt as a place called Goshen, where Joseph and his family were settled. And Pharaoh said that in the best of the land, they were exempted from the calamity that was befalling them. Brethren, may I speak to you? If you're a believer and you are born again, 
and you have God, you have Christ inside of you, you are exempted from the so called economic crisis that is about to happen. May I, can I have an amen? May I declare to you by the word of the Lord, if you do the principles and you follow these things that we're sharing with you, and we've been sharing since the last couple of weeks. People may say there's a casting down, but you shall say there's a lifting because you'll be exempted from the woes that is happening. Hallelujah. In the same land, in the same land, in the same geographical space, but a place called Goshen was exempted. I see God exempting you in the name of Jesus. Now, let's quickly go to the lessons to be learned. Number one, lesson that we can draw from this case, which today is, 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 is you know, happening in our own very eyes. There is the law of exemption that was at work in the life of Joseph, which by extension was also at work in his family. There was there is a law of exemption. So Joseph was exempted from the famine. Joseph was exempted from the calamity that was befalling Egypt. We did not have any record that Joseph had to sell anything. And by extension, his family and everybody around him, praise the Lord. May I also declare to you, if you are born again, there is the law of exemption that believers are made to be partakers of. Hallelujah. May I declare to you, if you are born again, you are also a partaker of the law of exemption. How do I know that? Let me show you from scriptures. Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Hallelujah. So get this and let get it clear and get excited about it. Psalm 91, verse 10. Psalm 91 and verse 10. Psalm 91 and verse 10. There shall no evil before thee, neither shall any plague or famine or COVID or pandemic or any economic woe come nigh thy dwelling. There shall no evil before thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Go up a little to verse 7. Verse 7 says, a thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but thou sh but it shall not come near thee. Hallelujah. A thousand may fall at your side. People may be dying of starvation. People may be having all those things. But guess what? The Bible says that, but it shall not come nigh thee. Why? Verse 1. Verse 1 gives the answer to that. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. As you are born again, you are dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. The Bible says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. As you run into the name of the Lord, as you run into the, as you run onto the strong tower, you are shielded from plague. You are shielded from economic woes in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So that is a pointer that you have the law of exemption. Open with me to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. Let's see another scripture that established the fact that you are exempted. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 17. <clears throat> I hope you have been blessed. Verse 7 and verse 8. Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17 verse 7 and verse 8. Jeremiah 17 verse 7 and verse 8. Blessed is the man that trusted in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Blessed is the man that trusted in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. Verse 8. For it shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spread out our roots by the river, and shall not see when it cometh, but our leaves shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding our food. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says that for such a person that trusts the law, it shall be like a tree planted by the water and spreads out our roots by the river. He shall not see when it cometh. When they say, oh, there's heat. Oh, there's downturn. There's an uh, economic recession. There's a um, 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 rise sizing. There's redundancy. You are not partaker of it because the law of exemption is working in you. Hallelujah. It says that our leaves shall be evergreen. And shall not be careful in the year of drought. He will not even, he will not be mindful, he will not be aware that there's drought. They say, Oh, there's drought. They say, Okay, really, I'm not aware. You are still eating your three square meal because your trust is in the law, because God is your source, because you are connected to the real source, and therefore you are you are not careful. When KJV says you are not careful, that means that you are not perturbed, you are unruffled about the drought. He says that neither shall cease from yielding our fruit. Praise the Lord. So the first 
parallel we draw from the story in Egypt is that just as Joseph was exempted from the plague that was happening, you and I as believers were exempted from the calamity that is befalling the world. May I prophesy to somebody that is listening to me, by the word of the Lord, as long as you are born again, as long as you are connected to God, who is your source, I decree and I declare that the law of exemption from failure, from calamity, from lack, that law will be operational in your life in the name of Jesus. Amen. That law of exemption from evil and from woe and from heartaches shall be operational in your life in the name of Jesus. Amen. Second parallel that I want to draw is that God raised a deliverer called Joseph. In Genesis chapter 45, verse 4, verse 5, and verse 7, because of time, um, I'm a bit mindful of time, but let's read it all the same. God raised a deliverer. Genesis chapter 45. Genesis chapter 45, verse 4, verse 5, and verse 7. Genesis chapter 45. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said unto him, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold unto Egypt. Now therefore, be not grieved. I'm not angry with, and not be angry with yourselves. That you, that you sold me ether. For God did send me before you to preserve life. God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. Verse 7. And God sent me before you to preserve you a prosperity, posterity in the land, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. God sent me ahead to, you know, preserve you a posterity in the land and to save you. So, God sent Joseph ahead, even though they didn't know it at that time. It was God orchestrating and God sent him ahead. So God raised a deliverer for Joseph. In every famine situation, God raises a deliverer. Even at this moment, God is raising deliverers. You need to position and remain sensitive in the spirit to identify your deliverer. May we all locate our heaven sent deliverer in the name of Jesus. Even at this moment, when things are chaotic, when things are going out of tune, when things are, you know, just... God is sending deliverers. Just as God sent Joseph ahead, uh, knowing that there was going to be famine, and God sent Joseph ahead to preserve uh, Jacob and his lineage, God has already sent a deliverer ahead of you. All you need to do is to ask God to enlighten you, to position, to discover who that deliverer is. A connection, a phone call, somebody somewhere, God orchestrating you somewhere. I have testimony. In fact, just yesterday I was sharing testimony with some of, my, some of my brethren of how God, I was staying on my own. God caused me to connect two people and by the grace of God, when those two people did a transaction, they said, ah, Tunde, thank you very much for connecting us. And they dropped something in my account that was wow to me. Even in this time when you say that, oh, um, uh, there's still challenges, people are closing deals and God will send you that deliverer in the name of Jesus. You would be in a position to locate that, that deliverer in the name of Jesus. Number three, that uh, one want to draw from that story of Joseph, or the story in Egypt. Joseph was bestowed with deep insight, uncommon wisdom, and business acumen. Through Joseph, Pharaoh became extremely powerful, and he practically owned everything in Egypt. We have read it already in Genesis chapter 47 that we read, Genesis chapter 47, verse 20, verse 23 to 26. They sold, first of all, money after money filled. They gave up their cattle after cattle filled. They gave up their land after land. They gave up themselves. So, through the wisdom that God gave Joseph, Joseph was able to acquire on behalf of Pharaoh the land. And Pharaoh became extremely powerful and extremely, extremely rich. So, there was wealth transfer even during the time of famine. There was wealth transfer. There was a transfer of wealth even from the people to Pharaoh. During this time also, God is still in the business of invoking the law of supernatural wealth transfer. Hallelujah. Even when, when, even in this time, this difficult time, God can invoke and is invoking the law of supernatural wealth transfer such that the wealth of the Gentiles, the wealth of the unbeliever are coming into your hand. How do I know that? Open with me to Isaiah chapter 45, verse 2 and verse 3. Isaiah chapter 45. May I prophesy to somebody that is listening to me by the word of the Lord, the same way that God gave Joseph business acumen, wisdom, and insight, and he was able to acquire wealth even for Pharaoh. May God give you and I 
the business acumen, the wisdom, the world without, the positioning, such that the wealth of the unbelievers, the wealth of the, uh, of the Gentiles can be transferred to us. Amen. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 2 and verse 3. God speaking here. He says, I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. Verse 3. And I will give thee, hallelujah, you that you are born again, you that you are a, a, a righteousness of God in Christ, I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. That is to say, wealth unknown, wealth untold, wealth that are hidden, wealth that people are, 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 are not taking advantage of. God says that there will be a supernatural wealth transfer. Even in this time of famine, a supernatural wealth transfer from the unbeliever to you so that you can prosper. Now, when God begins to do that, it is for the kingdom. Praise the Lord. It's not for you to go and be throwing parties. It's for the kingdom. That you may know that I am the Lord, which call thee by name. I am the God of Israel. Praise the Lord. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by name, am the God of Israel. Praise the Lord. So, we saw a supernatural word transfer even in the land of Egypt in, during the famine. In this period as well, I see God bringing about a supernatural word transfer in the name of Jesus. Amen. God can and he would position his faithful children to have a unique proposition that the world will crave for and the world will pay for. I see God making us solution carriers even in the midst of chaos. I see God positioning his children to be the ones that have an invention, a solution, an idea, some innovation that the world will say, wow, we need this. And they will be willing to pay stupendous money for. I see God giving us wisdom, even in our places of work, in our, in our marketplaces, wherever we are. I see God transferring wealth. It's not by fall down and die. It is not by juju. It is by the God giving his children wisdom to, in, to be inventors, to be innovators, to come up with ideas, to come up with stuff in the marketplace, in the office, such that your ideas, your, 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 your wisdom, your innovation is patented and it is paid for. If you are a computer person, you can you code and you are able to do that, that people will pay for. That is what it is. Joseph, God gave him unusual business acumen and he was able to gather during the seven years of plenty, he gathered into the storehouses when the seven years of famine now came. He was releasing and he was selling. He was releasing. Let me ask a question. During the seven years of plenty, why didn't, the, why didn't nobody else decide to gather? Why didn't anybody else decide to save for the, uh, for the rain, so-called rainy day? It's because it was a divine wisdom that God gave Joseph. Hallelujah. Because God knew there was going to be transference of wealth. So in this period, as you stay close to God, as you also stay, you know, meditating on God, God will begin to give you great ideas, innovative ideas that will deliver serious, stupendous wealth into your hand in the name of Jesus. That is what is called supernatural wealth transfer. Hallelujah. Number four, another parallel I can draw. When the famine started, Joseph was able to meet the needs of the people, perhaps the entire world at that time, because of what he has stored up during the period of famine. Let's go to Genesis chapter 41, verse 48 and 49. Genesis chapter 41. Genesis 41, verse 48 and 49. Genesis 41, verse 48 and 49. And Joseph gathered up all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. The food of the field, which was round about every city, laid it up at the same. Verse 49, very instructive. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea, very much, until he left numbering, for it was without number. So during the period of plenty, Joseph was storing up, storing up, storing up, storing up. He, at a point in time, he lost count of his store because there was, it was so much. Now, this throws up a very important spiritual parallel. Because of what Joseph has stored up, Joseph became a deliverer. Joseph was able to be releasing during the uh, period of famine, was releasing from that store was releasing from that store. He was saving lives. He was saving lives. He was saving lives. And by reason of that, there was supernatural wealth transfer. May I ask you a question, dear believer? What have you been storing up that you can now call upon? 
What have you been storing up that you cannot call upon? How much prayer have you stored up? How much kingdom investment have you stored up? How much of sowing into other people's lives have you stored up? What is your spiritual bank account balance like? Beloved, if you have not been storing up, it will be difficult to call up. If you have not been storing up, it will be difficult to call up. If you have not been sowing into lives, if you have not been involved in kingdom investment, if you have not been involved in kingdom business, if you have not been diligent in your prayer life, if you have not been diligent in your word study, if you have not been diligent in the things of the kingdom, it will be difficult for you to call anything up. Joseph was able to call up because in the years of plenty was storing up. It is difficult for you to be able to say, God, remember my faithfulness. In Acts chapter 10, the Bible says of Colinius, when Colinius was praying, it says that, and an angel appeared to him and said that Colinius, thy arms given as ascended unto God as a memorial. Everybody could testify that Colinius was a good man. He was, he was always blessing lives. That was why God could send an angel to ask that he should send for Peter and get a solution for salvation and for deliverance. The question, therefore, is that as a believer, what have you been storing up? What is in your spiritual bank account? What can you call upon during the period of famine now? If you have not been given, the Bible says, give and shall be given unto you. If you have not been given, there's nothing to be given back unto you. If you call upon God now, God will say, okay, I've checked your bank account to my dear son, my dear daughter. It is empty. May that not be a portion in Jesus' name. So therefore, for you to be partaker of the spiritual word transfer, sorry, for the uh, supernatural word transfer, you need to have stored up in your spiritual bank account good virtue. You need to have stored up in your bank account prayer. You need to have stored up in your bank account kingdom investment. You need to have stored up in your bank account sowing into lives, being a blessing to people, blessing people. When you had the resource, did you chop it alone? If you chop it alone, too bad. You may just be on your own now. But if you have been investing in lives, you can call up. The Bible says that either give it to the poor, lend it unto the Lord. If you have been a blessing to people, this is time that God will bring it up as a memorial. Praise the Lord. But if you have not been doing so, I don't know. But you still have an opportunity to repent and to begin to quickly stop, stop, stop. Bible says Joseph stood up a lost count of his storehouse. May I encourage you to also begin to stop because it is what you stop that you're able to call up. Praise the Lord. What you store up is what you're able to call up. Store up nothing, call up nothing. That will not be a portion in Jesus' name. Now, to survive this trying time, there are spiritual steps to be taken and there are physical steps to be taken. They, they are not mutually exclusive. Rather, they are mutually inclusive. You must do both to get the desired results. In order to survive this challenging, difficult moment, this trying time, you must engage in certain spiritual steps and you must engage in certain physical steps. One does not supersede the other. One does not override the other. You must do the spiritual and you must do the physical. Today, we'll speak about the spiritual. Next Wednesday, we'll continue. Two things I want to drop today for us to partake of. I said to us, to survive the onslaught of the economic meltdown and the challenges that the world is about to face, which the economy will crumble, which money will fail us, you must position yourself to do this spiritual and these physical things. Number one, feed your faith and starve your fear. You must do away with anything that is a source of fear. Anything that brings fear and apprehension and that brings palpitation your way, do away with it quickly. If it's turning to news and you are hearing, oh, uh, oil price has cr crashed to sub-zero, how will Nigeria survive? And it is giving you heartache, please turn off your TV. If it's, you keep company with friends and you people are analyzing, analyzing, and I keep analyzing the economy and they tell you that, you know what, ah, our a, a, a foreign reserve has dwindled, now we don't even know, and it is causing you fear. As a believer, it is taking your place of faith. Please do away with it. S s feed your faith, starve your fear. Our text, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23, that we read, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23 that we read, says that we should hold fast the message translation says that we should firmly grip, we should have a firm grip. The NLT says we should hold tightly. The NIV says we should hold unswervingly. We should hold tight, hold fast our faith. Keep your faith tenaciously. 
This means that we should not be careless about the things of the faith. So you must ensure that you keep faith alive, keeping faith alive. Do away with any source of fear. Embrace the source of faith. I have three points here that I want to encourage you that will help you to boost your faith and that will help you to keep faith and to feed your faith. Number one, get faith-inspiring scriptures that talk about God's promises and meditate and confess them. Um, last Sunday, we read a few of those scriptures. Was it last Sunday or Wednesday? I can't remember now. Psalm 34, verse 10. I'm being young, now I'm old. I've not seen the righteous forsaken or sit begging bread. Um, the young lambs do suffer want, and, and the young lambs do lack and suffer want. But they, tra- they that trust God shall lack nothing good. Uh, Philippians 4 19. But my God shall supply my. So, so, go into the scriptures. Find all those faith inspiring scriptures. Those things that speak and build your faith. Begin to meditate on them. When you meditated on them, confess them regularly. Open your mouth and confess them. Numbers 14 28. As he have spoken in my ears, so will I do unto you. So when you confess the fact that I am the righteousness of God, I will not beg for bread. I will not suffer hunger. The young lambs may suffer hunger, but I will not suffer hunger. Um, the psalmist says, I've been young and old. I've not seen the righteous forsaken. I will not be forsaken. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. My God shall supply all my needs according to Jesus in glory by Christ Jesus. I am like a tree planted by the rivers of water. My leaves do not wither. Everything I lay my hands upon prospers. Psalm 1, verse 1 to 3. Confess. You just confess all of those scriptures. As you confess them, faith arises in you. So get faith-inspiring scriptures that talk about God's promises. Let these scriptures sink into your subconscious. Let these scriptures sink into your subconscious. Meditate on them. Feed on them. Ponder on them. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. We read it last Wednesday. Let's read it again. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Philippians 4 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things of good report, like the message we are bringing out, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. The things you should think about, the things you should fit your mind on, are things that are lovely, honest, just, pure, of good report, that have virtue. Praise the Lord. So meditate on scriptures. Get a concordance or you know, you can easily go on, on, online. Such scriptures that speak to the fact that God will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews says that and I can say that the Lord will never leave me nor forsake me. Therefore, I can boldly speak. You know, find scriptures that speak to these things. And when you meditate on them, they inspire faith in you. Number two, listen to faith inspired mes- inspiring messages. So, get inspired scriptures. Then listen to faith inspiring messages. Read faith building materials. Tune in to faith elevating media. Don't tune in to social media that is bringing fear. Listen to messages that build faith. Listen to music that builds faith. Tune in to radio stations that are that speaks faith. Read books or other Christian materials that speaks faith that will help your faith level to be boosted. When you do these things, faith arises in you. Then you know that I'm though I'm in the world. I'm not of the world. Why? Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You can begin to confess those scriptures and as you confess those scriptures, you realize that your faith level is built up. And number three, surround yourself with faith engaging people of of positive vibe and influence. Surround yourself with people of faith that engage in positive vibe and influence. Don't surround yourself with people that say that, oh, Nigeria is doomed. If America is suffering, then what is the hope of Nigeria? Ah, we are all doomed. We are... Please, get away from such people. Rather, surround yourself with people of like mind, who re- have an understanding of the times, who are positioning with the scriptures, and who are running with the scriptures. Surround yourself with such people. So, the one spiritual activity you need to do to be able to survive this trying time is feed your faith, starve your faith. How should you do that? Get faith-inspiring scriptures. Meditate on them. Confess them regularly. Listen to faith-inspiring messages. Read faith-inspiring uh, books. Tune in to faith-inspiring media. And number three, surround yourself with faith-engaging people. People of like mind that would encourage you to move on. Praise the Lord. 
The second spiritual activity you need to engage in is that you must pray that your eyes of understanding be enlightened. It's very, very critical because this leads to the physical. I told us that we need to engage in spiritual activities and physical activities. Now, this second point, if you do it very well, it will lead to the physical activity. So you must pray that your eyes of understanding may be enlightened. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18 says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, being opened, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of your calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Hallelujah. When God enlightens you, you'll be able to know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. To know that you are not just a chicken that can be killed anyhow. To know that you are not just an ordinary person. You have an inheritance in Christ Jesus. It is rich. It is powerful. We are going to pray that Lord, open the end. Uh, open my eyes of understanding. Enlighten my eyes of understanding. Open my eyes to see beyond these natural eyes. Let my spiritual eyes see. What do you want to see? Those things that Joseph saw and he was able to store up in the seven years of plenty. And he opened up his store. What are you praying that God should enlighten your eyes to see? To see business opportunities. To see an innovation that you can bring to bear. To see an invention you can invent. To see Something that you can do that will profit you, that will lead to a mega profiting. That is what you are going to be praying about. That Lord, open my eyes of understanding. In Genesis chapter 21 and verse 19. Why is this prayer very important? Let me show you. Genesis chapter 21 and verse 19. Now, in Genesis chapter 21, because of time, Sarah felt when Isaac was born that there was competition. Because I, a, a guy had had a Ishmael for, for Abraham. So Sarah said to Abraham, you know what? Get rid of the bond woman. Get rid of Ega and her son, Ishmael. I don't want them to compete with my son, Isaac. No problem. Abraham sent them away. Now, Abraham sent a guy and Ishmael away with just one bottle of water. After the bottle, after the water ran out, a guy put Ishmael at a distance and said, you know, this guy is going to die of you know, of um, um, lack of water. But something happened in verse 19. Genesis chapter 21, verse 19. And God opened her eyes, the eyes of Agai, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. Question, was this well just manufactured right there and then? The answer is no. The well had always existed, but a guy needed her eyes to be opened. There are business opportunities around us, milling around us, just around us, but we need our eyes of understanding to be enlightened. Just as a guy, just as Ishmael and a guy would have died for lack of water and food. Meanwhile, right there and there where they were, there was a well. But it took the opening of Agar's eyes to see that well. You and I need to pray and say, Oh Lord, in this period, Open my eyes of understanding. Open my eyes to see business that are passing by, passing me left, right, and center. Open my mind. Open my inner mind. Open my, the eyes of my inner mind to know creative things I can do, that I can profit with. Help me. Give me a creative wisdom. Give me a new insight, something I can do differently. In those of us who are in paid employment, all our employers are now looking for efficient way of doing stuff. You know, efficient way that will save cost. You can be that person that God will give an idea to say, ah, how have we been doing this thing like this? Can we do it this way so that we can save costs? And then that would be something that your employer will hold on to and say, we need to keep this guy, we need to profit him. So that's why you need your eyes on the sentiment enlightened. Same thing. Look at Genesis chapter 22, verse 13. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 13. Genesis 2, 13, 22 and verse 13. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a ticket by his aunt. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. So all along, there was a ram because even Abraham was confessing faith and said that, my son, the Lord himself will provide a ram. And God provided that ram and Abraham did not see it until God opened his eyes and he looked behind him and saw that ram. Abraham would have killed his son Isaac for nothing. Meanwhile, God had made provision for a ram. 
we need God to enlighten us, to open our eyes of understanding. We need God to open our eyes of understanding, to see opportunities that we can leverage on, and we can profit thereby. Open with me, 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 2. 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 2. So it's important that we need to pray that prayer. It's important that we need to pray that prayer. 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 2. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in your house? And the woman answered, The handmaiden at, at nothing in the house, save a pot of oil. Ah, oh my show. The woman answered Elijah and said, Elijah, listen, I don't have anything but just one small, small pot of oil. And this oil is safe. How far with it? Do you know, and those of us who are familiar with the scriptures know it, that this same so-called small pot of oil was what God breathed upon by the word of the Lord upon the mouth of Elijah. And that oil continued to produce, continued to produce, continued to produce. And they were, from that little pot, they were filling bigger pots, filling bigger pots. And they continued to fill pots. They borrowed pots from their neighbors. They continued to fill until they ran out of pots before the oil stopped. And by the time they sold that oil, they paid their debt. They lived upon the, the money that came and they sustained life. All you have to do is to pray that God open my eyes of understanding. Don't be a, a one straight, one jacketed person. All I know is one this way. You can, God can open your eyes to see substance that you have never seen before. And you need that prayer because in, to survive this famine, you need that kind of miracle. Praise the Lord. John chapter, eight, John chapter 6 and verse 9. John chapter 6 and verse 9. My time is running up. I need to begin to wrap round up. John chapter 6 and verse 9. When Jesus had to feed the multitude, in John chapter 6 and verse 9, Andrew said, There's a lad here which had five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Jesus said, Give these guys, they've been with me, 5,000 men, they've been with me for so long, let's feed them. He said, Where are we going to get food to give all these guys? Somebody now said, eh, But actually, there's a guy here that has five pieces of bread and two pieces of fish. But, I mean, this is not even enough for this lad. They did not know that that so-called five pieces of bread and two pieces of fish was what Jesus needed to multiply and to feed 5,000 men. Beloved, you need to pray that prayer that God open my eyes of understanding. We need God to open our eyes of, up to opportunities that are bound around us. If we, max, if we can maximize, we can deliver great dividends to us. If God opens our eyes of understanding to opportunities that when we maximize them, they deliver great fortunes to us. I pray that as you do that, God will help us in the name of Jesus. We need to pray specific and strategic. We need to, we need to be specific and strategic in our prayers. We need to begin to ask God to lead us to the path of sustenance. We need to begin to ask God that God lead me to the path. In Psalm 23 verse 2, it says that, you know, thou prepared a table for me, and thou leadest me in the path of righteousness for their, for their namesake. We need to ask God to lead us in the path of righteousness. In Psalm 16, verse 11, it says that, Psalm 16, verse 11, we are very familiar with. For the Lord will show me what? The path of life, the path of blessings, the path of abundance. For the Lord will show us the path of life. For in his presence there is fullness of joy, and his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Lord, show me the path of life. We need to begin to pray that prayer that God will show us the path of life. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 12 and verse... Let's just read it. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 12. We need to ask God to show us the path to follow. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 12. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 12 says, So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. He made him right on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. He made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock, butter for kind and milk for sheep with the fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat that thou drinkest the pure blood of the grape. Verse 12, so the Lord alone did lead him and there was no strange God with him. Praise the Lord. When God leads you, all of these things in verse 13 and verse 14 will happen to you. You eat, you over, you over belly full. So we need to ask God, praying specifically and strategically, Lord, lead us in the path 
of sustenance. Praise the Lord. Number two, we need to pray God for the spirit of discernment to be able to properly interpret the events and happenings around us so as to know the will of God per time. We need to ask God for the spirit of discernment. And so when God gives us the spirit of discernment, we'll be able to discern what is happening around us. We'll be able to take advantage if it's a time to invest. Like now, the market, capital market has crashed. The real estate market has crashed. You need to ask God for spirit of discernment to know, God, should I enter now? If, it's, if God is leading you to enter the capital market now, you invest. When the market picks up, you will make a kill. But you need the spirit of discernment to be able to do that. Finally, as a wrap up, we need to pray that God will connect you with destiny helpers. We need to pray, and that prayer is that just as God used Joseph as a restorer and as a deliverer and as a preserver for um, the, 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 the the Joseph and um, um, is 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 sorry for Jacob and his people and his children. We need God to even use us to be preservers, and we need to ask God that God. Connect me with my helpers of destiny. Connect me with messengers of my joy. Let's see First Samuel chapter 30. We have an encounter here. First Samuel chapter 30. First Samuel chapter 30. We see an example of um, David. When David had gone to fight and the Amalekites came and carried his, all their wives, all their children, all their cattle, carried everything. But there was an empire of destiny. First Samuel chapter 30, verse 11. And they found an Egyptian in the field. And they brought him to David and gave him bread and did eat. And they made him drink water. So they found this guy who would turn out to be the helper of their destiny for the recovery of their, cho- of their wives and children and of all that they have lost. Verse 16. And when he had brought them down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing. So this same guy, this Egyptian, little boy Egyptian that David and his men found was the same guy that led David and his army to where the camp of the Amalekites were. And by that singular act, David was able to recover all. So you are going to be praying that God lead me to my helpers of my destiny, to my messengers of my joy. In John chapter 1 and verse 41, John as I round up, John chapter 1 and verse 41 and verse 42. John chapter 1, verse 41 and verse 42. John chapter 1, verse 41 and verse 42. Talking about Andrew. And Andrew founded his own brother, Simon, and he said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which has been interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. So Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Who was the helper of uh, Peter's destiny? His brother, Andrew. Because if Andrew had not taken Peter to Jesus, all the exploits we hear of uh, Peter today may not have happened. But God used Andrew as a helper to Peter's destiny. And through the, through the connection, even in fact, Interestingly, we now hear more of Peter than we even had of Andrew. So you are going to begin to pray that God should connect you to the helpers of your destiny. Praise the Lord. So we'll continue next Wednesday. But I want you to understand that there's no shaking for the believers, those who are believers in Christ Jesus, those who are trusting in God, those who, have the, who are the righteousness of God, despite everything that may happen around you. Know that they that trust the Lord shall be like man Zion. We cannot be moved. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so will the Lord surround you and encompass you and keep you in the name of Jesus. If you are not born again, there is need for you to be afraid. If you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you really, really, really need to be afraid. Why? Because the economy is failing. Money will fail you. But you can quickly run to Jesus. You can quickly come to him. You can quickly surrender your life. Let him be your Lord and your master so that he, he, he has responsibility for you. If you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I confess my sins. I declare that I'm a sinner and I ask that you forgive me. Wash me with your blood. I confess you as my Lord. I accept you into my heart. I declare that I'm born again. I declare that as from today, I'm a new creature. All things are passed away. My sins are forgiven. 
I'm received into the beloved. I thank you, Jesus, because I am saved. I'm delivered and have a new life in Jesus' name. Let me pray for you. Father, as many as have prayed that simple prayer of faith, let faith arise in them. Holy Spirit, complete the work. Lord, do what you alone can do. Accomplish that work of salvation in their lives and write their name in the book of life in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we are prayed. Amen. Amen. It's time now for us to partake of the communion. Those of us on Instagram, I'm sorry, the connection has pushed. Um, I apologize for that. Um, but those of us on Facebook, we can continue. Take the bread and take the wine as we break and partake of the communion. The communion, as we take it, is a symbol of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And it is giving us... For us to, the Bible says, Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in members of me. When we do this, it brings about life. It brings about, you know, reassurance that just as it was impossible for sicknesses and diseases to hold Jesus down, as we partake of the bread and the, and, uh, and the wine, it represents the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Life is restored unto us. So, partake of the bread and be blessed. Take the communion, take the wine, and drink. Father, we thank you for the life that is released in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. As we partake of this, O oh God, let a life be restored unto us. We receive Zoe, the life of God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Rejoice. Thank God. Give him praise. Give him honor. Give him adoration. Thank you for staying tuned. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the time spent in your presence. We thank you, Father, for the word that we have studied. Thank you for faith that has arisen in us. Lord, we pray that we will not go back even to fear. We will starve our fear. We will feed our faith. Lord, as we take it to all of these things that we have learned, Lord, we will be the hearers and the doers of your word. And we will profit thereby in the name of Jesus. I pray for everyone that has listened and is will even listen afterwards. Lord, we pray. As we do these principles, O oh God, let us receive the reward and the blessing thereof in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. I pray for anyone who is passing through one difficulty or one challenging period right now. Lord Jesus, we are the balm in Gilead. We release the soothing balm, O oh God. Save a soul. Heal someone. Deliver someone. Anyone who is passing through a difficult, challenging time and they are finding it difficult to make ends meet and they are contemplating to just give up. Lord, let them not give up, O oh God. Send Help pass to them. Let them find help, O oh God. Miraculously, O oh God, that they may know that Jesus is Lord. Because they have listened to this word, O oh God, and faith has arisen in them, O oh God. Send help unto them. In Jesus' mighty name we are prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining in. Um, if you want to reach us, please you can feel free to call us on 0817-9070-250. 0817-9070-250. Or send us an email tkc.lecky tkc.lecky at gmail.com Please stay tuned again on Sunday 9am, this same place on Facebook or Instagram. The Lord bless you. The Lord increase you. The Lord enlarge you. The Lord perfect all that concerns you. You are not a victim of accidental discharge. You are not a victim of one million boys. You are not a victim of ritual killing. You are not a victim of calamity. Your life is preserved. It is well with you. It is well with yours. The Lord will continually provide for you. Supernatural provision. Supernatural increase. Supernatural blessings in the name of Jesus. How it will be, you may not know. Just as Mary said, how shall these things be? Seeing that I know no man. The Lord will make a provision for you in the name of Jesus. Go forth and prosper. Increase on all sides. COVID-19 is not your portion. Any disease is not your portion. Because the blood of Jesus speaks for you. In Jesus' mighty name. I love you. Jesus loves you. Stay blessed and stay on top. In Jesus' name, amen.